The Legal Corner podcast series. Welcome to today's episode of The Legal Corner, a podcast which covers a variety of legal issues to keep you informed. Hosted by attorney at law Colin Dinoon and communication specialist Leonardo Torres. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Legal Corner Podcast Series. In this episode, we'll be looking at creating healthy workplaces. Our distinguished guests today are Akira Heath-Adams and Tanisha Heath-Adams. They are a power couple and they are the founders of Heath-Adams Leadership. Just to tell you a a bit about them. I will start with Akira. He is 28 years old and he's happily married to his co-founder. And he is a national scholarship winner. He is also an attorney at law. He would have entered private practice upon being called to the bar, where he tried most areas until he niched down into employment law and industrial relations. By doing this, he began consulting companies and working closely with leadership. That is when his passion for leadership was reignited because he saw up close how leadership issues are the root cause of all other issues in business. He realized that a common theme in all his workplace experiences was that there were always leadership problems. Uh, just to tell you a bit about uh, Mrs. Eat Adams. So she is a educational consultant and the co-founder of Heat Adams Leadership and also the founder of T Garcia education. She's also 28 years old, happily married to her best friend and business partner. For as long as she can remember, education has been a passion and she always saw it as a ticket to a different life. She came from extremely humble beginnings in South Trinidad and she graduated summa cum laude from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. She started an online tutoring company in 2020 where at one point she was leading 25 plus educators. That online school focused on preparing K through 12 students. After three successful years, she made a big switch with TGE. She works solely with parents in TGE and leaders in Heat Adams Leadership. Her intentional parenting program recently launched, and she looks forward to working with many parents all over the world. The goal at TGE is to help 1 million parents by 2033. They are both in San Mateo, California at this point in time, and they are hoping to take both Heat Adams leadership and TGE to the next level. So good day to you, Akira and Tanisha. How are you guys doing today? Hi. <laughs> nice intro. <laughs> um, we're great. Uh, thank you. Lovely. And of course, as very, I always say, great. welcome to the Legal Corner. Thank you so much for having us, Colin. We are very grateful to be here and hopefully we can add some value and entertainment to your audience today. Of course. You know, Akira, we, we went to law school together and, you know, you're a, a young fella, I could say, that... Um, You know, I always enjoy your vibe. I always enjoy being around you, your company. And, um, you know, you are one of those few persons, I would say, who would um, stand up to me, you know, (laughs) whether right or wrong. And I respect you for that. All right. So, um, yeah. Let's get right into it. Uh, We're talking today about creating healthy workplaces and I'll start off with you, Akira. And what are the characteristics of a healthy workplace? Some of the main characteristics, and I'll just list them. And if we want to talk in detail about anyone, no problem. The first one is strong leadership. Everything starts at the top, and you need to have a good leader in order to have a healthy, successful workplace. The next one is a compelling vision of positive and fulfilling culture high productivity and accountability, and trust in relationships. Now, as you mentioned in in the intro, that in my experiences, I haven't really come across this combination of things too much. And in my opinion, 
the biggest reason for that is the first thing that I started with, strong leadership. You need to have a leader who, who is somebody who is healthy themselves in all aspects of the world, right? Especially with actually having that deep desire and that deep drive to make the workplace into something fulfilling. When, when you appreciate that as a leader, you are responsible for making an environment where people can thrive and be happy and be healthy and be fulfilled. That's the energy you bring every day. And you start handling things differently just because you always have that in your mind. You know that I actually care about my people's health, their physical health. I want them to eat good. I want them to exercise. I want to give them work that's stimulating to them. I don't want to be harsh on them. I don't want to scream at them. I don't want to overburden them with work. When you actually care like that, when that is the leader you have, then things fall into place and, you, and it's much easier to have a healthy workplace and you don't have to do anything extra or try these random fads. You know, you just have to be yourself. So it always starts with, with the leader. Once he's a, a healthy person in every sense of the word and or she is and wants to create that type of environment for people, things will fall into place and, and then you get all the other things that, that I mentioned. And if you want to talk about any in detail, me or Tanisha will be very happy to expand on it a little bit. Yeah, I would like to chime in um, just to talk about that compelling vision um, because uh, the your vision for your company is like your compass, you know, and uh, it uh, is what uh, everyone in the company should uh, be working towards. And many times uh, you read the vision of a company and it's something that they just put together some nice big words that sound good. Nobody actually knew what it means. Um, and in order to have a team and to have the full team effort working towards accomplishing this vision, the person from the lowest rank to the CEO level has to understand how they contribute directly to achieving this vision because that then gives them a real sense of purpose, a real sense of belonging, uh, that they're working towards something much bigger than themselves. Uh, so with strong leadership, you got to have a strong team. And the only, re the only way to really have that is to have everybody on the same page working towards uh, this big company vision. I like that you mentioned vision because I am a big believer in vision and of the power of vision to bring persons together to achieve a, a common goal. And that definitely would be an important facet of having a healthy workplace. I have another question for you, Akira. Can a healthy workplace become unhealthy? 100%. And I mean, that question could, the underlying principle of it applies across the board, which is that if you, even if you have something good today, it's not definitely going to stay good tomorrow unless you keep putting in the same work it takes to make it good in the first place. So, just as the last answer started with leadership, with the leader himself or herself, is the same for this one. If you have a leader whose standards slip, like you stop prioritizing the health and well-being of your people, I um, mean, because you're going through something personally and, and your own health and well-being is, is being compromised. Now you don't place a priority on that for other people and you start behaving differently with them. Suppose the leader changes and you have a leader who is more, who's more traditional in the negative sense, where it's just giving orders, giving directions, and basically beating people if they don't fulfill their tasks that will immediately destroy it. So the leadership has to, has to be such that they continue prioritizing your own health and well-being and that of the people. And if not, the place will become unhealthy extremely quickly. And another one in particular is that trust is the key to these healthy and fulfilling environments. And as I said, that trust and respect takes a long time to build, but it can be broken in an instant. If leaders start doing things that cause their team to trust them less, that will quickly make the environment unravel. So some of the main ways that leaders break trust, uh, which is like quite common in our society, is, for example, promoting or hiring wrong people. Somebody who you have a personal relationship with, you know their uncle. So everybody in our society likes to talk about links culture. And it's true. It's not limited just to turn out, though, because anywhere people pull strings for the people they know, but if you, as a leader, let that come into your company and you start hiring or promoting people just because you're friends with them or you're friends with their family members, then the rest of the team is going to see that 
and they're not going to trust you. They're not going to believe that you have integrity. And people are going to start complaining by talking to each other. And all these things make the environment way more toxic, way more unhealthy. And even when leaders, and this is a big one that uh, up to yesterday I was talking about in a coaching session that many leaders are afraid to fire people even after you realize that they aren't a good fit, they aren't doing the job well. You know, they're complaining about everybody. They have something bad to say with everybody. Nobody, whenever they stay home, everybody's happy. But the leader would never take the step to sometimes even address that. And if it has been addressed, then they wouldn't take the step to take the person off the team to fire them, right? Because it, it, it is hard. It hurts people's feelings and stuff like that. But if you keep people around who have this impact, right? You said so kindly at the start that you always like my vibe and I, I might stand, I would stand up to you and call you out. And that's because we, we want an environment that, that's based on truth. We're not going to just sit down and let the wrong things happen and stuff like that. But if leaders allow that to happen, then that's going to mess up the culture. You're gonna, it, it's going to just go haywire in an instant. And that's something that happens far too often. Um, just in the same coaching sessions, the, my, my client was saying that, you know, she has somebody like that on the team. And it's affecting everybody. And basically, when that person is around, the environment is unhealthy. So these are some of the things that leaders need to avoid if they do want their healthy environment to become unhealthy. What would you say to a leader who has challenges dealing with conflict and confronting persons? Well, this is one of, if not the main challenge that leaders deal with in terms of how they lead and manage their teams. And the first thing I always start with is trying to, and Tanisha would speak, would speak more on the, the personal aspect where the self-accountability comes into play. But in terms of actually having difficult conversations, the first thing I tell you is, is you have to shift your mindset. You can't tell yourself that I'm going to tell this person this thing and it, it will hurt their feelings and that's such a bad thing to say and it's so unkind. That is not unkind. Kindness is telling people the truth. It's telling people the things that they need to work on so that they don't go down the wrong path because it ends with them probably getting fired if you don't take the time to correct them today. So you have, you have to understand that true kindness is being honest and upfront with people. Then you have to understand and accept that if you leave these things unaddressed, it's going to hurt that person because they'll never improve. It's going to hurt the team who will not be happy to have somebody who's underperforming or misbehaving on the team. It's going to hurt the company because you need everybody on the same page we can at their best if you want to achieve the vision. So if you care so much about the vision that you have for your company, you have to understand that when anything stands in the way of that, whether it's somebody performing poorly or, or making certain mistakes, if you care about the vision and you want to achieve it, you will address those things and you will do it immediately because it cannot wait. So it's all about getting them to understand how important it is and this is, and I seen yesterday in a session that this is true fairness and justice. This is not something wrong that you're doing. This is what is required. This is how you help people to real, right? So you don't run away from it. You don't avoid. You don't delay. You don't try to palm it off. So this is a big one where people, leaders, try to make HR the bad guy. Where you see in something that needs to be addressed, you know it has to be addressed, and you're telling HR handle the problem. That's not their job. You as the leader, it's your job. Accountability starts and ends with you. So when you see something happening, you have to address it. You can't be afraid, right? And and too many times people just allow those issues to just slide. And one of the main one of the main things as well is that there are different ways that leaders have to hold people accountable, or rather different things people have to be held accountable for. The easiest one is when people are not hitting targets. This is very, it's quantifiable, it's objective, it's easy. If I tell you you have to sell four cars a month and you only sell two, that's an easy conversation for us to have in terms of the fact that you know you already didn't meet the expectation. So we're just trying to understand why. That's hard for some people to do by itself, but it's the easier form of, of not meeting expectations. Where it's more difficult is when it, it comes to the value. It comes to how the person is as a person, who they are. And you don't have to tell that person, hey, you, you have a bad attitude, right? You, you're behaving very arrogant. You're not 
allowing other people to 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 put their ideas into work. You want you you're trying to take all the attention and it's it's killing the chemistry in the team. Right? You're you're only complaining about people, you're only gossiping. Right? You're not doing the right things that we need here if we want to have a true team. Right? This is not a one man show. You have to change the way you, you work with people. You have to change the way you talk to people. Because what you're doing right now isn't good enough. So when it comes to you as one adult telling the next adult these things, you start feeling awkward. You start feeling uncomfortable. When you think about it, your palms sweating, you know, your belly is a little uncomfortable. You might have to use the bathroom. So now you're just like, look, that, that, that's just how he is. Yes, um, or I, I'm not really here to babysit, you know. Everybody know what it's supposed to be. You start coming up with all the excuses, but you have to understand that your job as a leader is to build the company the right way. Whatever is the right way for you. I have my version of the right way. You would have yours. And when you know your values and your vision, everything has to be in line with that. So if in your values you have integrity, if anybody has been dishonest about anything, you have to address it with them. doesn't matter what it is. Even if it's something personal, right? Because that's just not who we are here. If you have humility, teamwork, kindness, love, purpose, compassion, whatever. Anytime people aren't doing these things because of their old habits and the way they grew up and all these things, you have to address it. And you have to know that if you don't, what is the cost of that? You're going to pay a big price by trying to avoid a difficult conversation. Is it worth it? Is it worth sacrificing your vision and your company because you don't want to have a five-minute conversation or a 10-minute conversation that you think is a bit harsh, right? So it's all about understanding it holistically. If you want your, if you want your vision to be achieved, you will do what, what it takes, which is not just you working hard because that part is easy after a while, right? We're working hard for a long time now. We're very normal with that. But the part of, about addressing difficult issues with people face-to-face before before it festers, you have to understand that sometimes that is the bigger that is the bigger price that you have to pay. That's the investment you have to make if you want your company to succeed. And uh, it's all in the mind. No. So once I get them to understand that, then then it becomes more tactical, and I just guide them as to how to do it, which is right. send a meeting. No, tell you them were them. talking to us about and before you were talking to us about what is a healthy workplace, and then we would have spoken about you know a workplace becoming unhealthy. Tell us now, how do we restore health to our place? So if our workplace has become unhealthy, what steps do we take now to restore our health? Me or Tanisha for this one? You can go ahead. You can go ahead. I'll, I'll start with the first one, as always, being the leader himself or herself. If the place has become unhealthy, you are doing something different. So you need to look at yourself and see the things that you need to improve. Right? Too many people like to look outside and they want to say that this person or that person isn't doing good enough. But you are accountable for all of that. So if they have reached that level of not being good enough, you, for one, allowed it to get there. And two, maybe that they just follow in your lead. So you have to correct yourself and start back doing the right things to create the positive environment. And then, which is connected to the last thing we just spoke of, when you start identifying root causes, when you fix yourself, you say, okay, fine, I'm now doing things in line again. And you start looking at other causes of the unhealthy environment, you know, which in most cases is people. So which people are contributing to the environment being like this? Now I need to start addressing them directly. I need to come call them for meetings, have meetings with them, understand why they are doing whatever they are doing that's hurting the environment. And I start giving them feedback and guidance on how to improve it. So those are, those are always the starting points. Start with yourself and then start actually giving feedback and addressing the elephants in the room because Almost every leader could point to the, the few people in the in the office who they don't have good relationships with, the who most of the other employees don't have good relationships with, and no, and they never address it, and then they're surprised that they have a toxic environment, right? So this is this is just my uh, advice for like how it how it starts in terms of correcting. So I don't think you should have some. Before I go to yeah, sure. I just want to share an anecdote. Yeah, Tanisha, before you come on, I just want to share an anecdote talking about resolving conflict. You know, I mm-hmm. once worked for someone who in that room where there were so many strained relationships in the workplace and the person I have a lot of respect for, but he never frontally addressed it. And it just goes to show that 
the failure of leadership to confront issues uh, really weakens morale and it hinders the organization or the entity from really operating at its, its maximum potential. Right? Yeah. Tanisha, I know you wanted to jump in and then I have a question for you, Tanisha, before we take a break. Okay. Um, yeah, well, to just, I mean, Akira put it very well, but uh, of course, my background is in education and a lot of these skills that you that you use, sorry, in managing a classroom and bringing out the best in students, all of that. Some of those same skills are what you use in the workplace. And some of those are exactly what I used when I managed my team of teachers at TGAS Education, right? One of the philosophies that I adopted from a famous educational philosopher is uh, uh, Haim Janot. Haim Janot, uh, and he spoke about the fact that uh, teachers uh, set the climate of the classroom. And in the same way, leaders set the climate of their workplace. So Haim had put really nicely uh, the saying, he said, I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my personal approach that creates the climate, my daily mood that makes the weather. I could, I possess tremendous power to make a student's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it's my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated. And all you have to do with what Haim so eloquently said is replace a classroom with workplace. So in terms of uh, uh, accountability and all of those things, uh, the leader sets the climate. So whenever those things uh, seem to be lacking in the workplace, uh, you need to look at yourself. If you can't have difficult conversations with people, is it that you don't have the difficult conversations with yourself? Are you not holding yourself accountable to your very own standards? And the thing is, your employees are going to be seeing that. So from day one, if you're not an embodiment of all the values that you claim to have the company built on, then it's just nobody's going to take it seriously. You know, so that's just to emphasize what Akira said, because I take it, uh, it's a personal belief of mine that, uh, you know, from my classroom, it was always me. And as a leader of your company, it's always going to be you. So I just wanted to emphasize that. All right, excellent. Nisha, tell me, what role does motivation and recognition play in staff development? Right. So in staff development, now, like I said, everything that I think about in the workplace, everything that I think about in staff, uh, in the staff development is exactly what I thought about with my students. Now, I'm not very big on uh, motivation too much just because motivation comes and goes. You know, it fluctuates all the time. But I'm big on sticking to the values. So one of the Big things in being a leader, first in personal leadership, is having your values and using your values as your constitution, as your code. So whatever you do, you stick to those values in every aspect of your life. And in the same way, um, in the workplace, it needs to, it's more so that you have to have these guiding values that you operate by so that everyone knows that we um, let's say you, ob you obviously want to always produce results, you know, whatever your company is, you want to produce results. And you know that in order to do that, you have to do whatever it takes, right? But if your values are, say, um, excellence, so we adhere to excellence in this establishment, then every single day, no matter what, uh, we're going to be showing up and we're doing our best because excellence is just always doing the best that you can do any given time. And the values have to be really, it has to be understood and it has to permeate everything that's done in the workplace. Um, not so much motivation because that's always going to be, uh, um, you know, fluctuating. And in terms of recognition, no, recognition is huge, you know, 
it's great to let people know when they're doing the right thing, that they're also doing the right thing. And, uh, um, you know, people feel better when you make them feel good about what they've done and when they realize that you do acknowledge when they do well. Many times people are quick, especially leaders, um, they're quick to point out when you do something wrong. But when you do something right, it's like crickets chirping, you know. So uh, recognition is huge in the workplace. And I think just telling somebody good job or, you know, um, I really appreciated how you handled that situation. I couldn't, um, I don't think I could have done it in that way. Like, that's going to go such a long way. And I guess that would that would kind of make somebody feel more motivated. But in terms of... Uh, uh, motivation and recognition in staff development. I think the foundation of uh, high standards in a workplace has more to do with what your values are and how do you um, how do you let those values uh, guide all of the things in the workplace um, more so than whether somebody's feeling motivated. Um, and then, of course, the the recognition goes a huge way because people need to know it's great to hear that you're doing a good job, um, you know, and just feel reassured in that. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. Tanisha, before the break, you were just talking to us about the role that motivation and recognition plays in staff development. I want to throw it back to you. Um, I want you to tell us what advice would you give to an employer who is looking to improve the productivity of his staff? All right. Not to sound like I'm on repeat, but Again, it just starts with you as the leader. What is your productivity looking like? If you have to be setting a high standard for productivity, nobody is ever supposed to be more productive than you. After you, it all just starts to trickle down. So you have to be setting the bar extremely high for how good you work, how fast you work, how accurate. You just have to set an extremely high standard. And after you do that, now comes the holding people to that same standard. It starts with setting good expectations. You set the expectations with the responsibilities people have to fulfill, the goals they have to meet, the values they have to uphold. So we listed some previous some values previously, but one of your values might be speed. So you expect people to work quickly. I'm not giving you a task to finish in two weeks. I'm giving you a task to finish in two hours. There is no reason for you to take long, right? Um, I think the law is called like Parkinson's, Parkinson's law or something, which is that how much ever space you have, people will fill that up. So if you give somebody two weeks to do a task, they'll take two weeks. Give them one hour, they'll take one hour. Everybody knows that around deadline time, you get into high gear, right? So it's the same thing all the time. So if we want to work fast here, we want to make quick decisions fast, this is the standard you have to set back for people. You need to let them know, this is what I want, this is how much I want, this is how fast I want it. And you, you keep measuring that performance. How are they doing in this? How are they doing in that? And then it's all about feedback. Feedback has to be constant. Every week, maybe you have a weekly reporting. So every week they have to come to you so that you know I did X, Y, and Z. These are my plans for next week. Okay, great. And now I'm hold, I'm holding you to that. Next week I need to see that you did all of that. And anytime you are falling short, I'm telling you quickly, one time. You didn't meet this target. You didn't do this thing. You did this thing, but not to the standard I like. You did it, but and it was a good standard, but it was too slow. And when you keep doing these things, so first of all, you're clear with what you want. You are you are at that same level that you want other people to be at, or you're even higher. You're letting them know exactly what you want from them at all times. You're measuring how they perform and you're giving them feedback about how they're doing. That will improve productivity. And then as Tanisha just said, if you're giving good recognition to the ones who are actually meeting it, you're telling them, wow, you're doing a great job. So happy to have you on the team. 
Their productivity is insane right now. That's just going to boost them up and make them want to be even more productive to get more praise from you because everybody loves praise. How would you advise leaders to cope with the pressures of leadership? Because if they are the ones who have to set the bar high, they have to set the standard, they have to exemplify everything that they want to see. We both know that yeah. there's a lot of stress. So how do they cope with all the demands associated? Say a lot of prayers. Say a lot of prayers. Have a nice wife. Um, go to the beach. And these are all the real things that, that I do, right? So, because you can't escape pressure, you can't escape doubts and anxiety. These things come. But what you have to do is not remain in a state of that. You can't be in a state of, of worry and fear and anxiety. Let it pass by. Acknowledge that it's there. But then move on. You know, say prayers and we really just, so we trust in God. It's like, okay, we know what we want to do. All we can do is our best. So when you have your routine and you remain disciplined, okay, I know I have to wake up at five, I have to go to the gym, then I come back, I do work from nine to 12, I have coaching, I have this, we have this meeting, we have that. You do your part and then you trust in the rest because we can't control outcomes, right? We can only do what we can do, we can control what we can't control and then we have to release the rest. So once you are clear with your vision that you want to achieve, you map out your routine to get there, you do your part every day, and that's all you can do. And then you just have to trust that things will fall into place. Because if you become too attached and too obsessed with, I need this to work out, I need this now, I need more clients, I need more money, you're going to be doomed. And this is how people end up with millions, yet they're depressed because they have no contentment in their heart. They don't know how to trust and go trust in the process. So you have to, you have to incorporate that into your lifestyle first and foremost. Because it's going to be pressure and it's going to be hard. If you have these things and you have a family that you could rely on, you know, and then you could be compressed with your exercise, with going to the beach, going on a walk, then it's, it's just about keep reminding yourself that this is normal. It's supposed to be hard at times. It's supposed to be pressure. And I'm not, I'm Anisha, not going to let it break me. I think... Anisha, I want to bring you in here yeah. on this one. Mm-hmm. I wanted to come in on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, go right ahead. Right. So um, I've held many leadership roles in the past, and it does feel like the world is on your shoulders. Um, you know, something about being being a leader, a true leader, is really a completely selfless act because it's all about bringing out the absolute best in everyone around you. And on top of that, leaders take most of the blame and least of the credit all the time. You know, so it it really is a a lot of pressure. And one thing that uh, has helped me, um, you know, when the stakes were high is just these four agreements that I made with myself based on the book, The Four Agreements. And the first one is uh, to be impeccable with your word. And that has to do with integrity. Um, That has to do with always uh, speaking and acting with integrity, saying what you mean, using your word to speak truth and to help direct the team that you're leading, but to also help direct yourself. Um, The next thing is to not take things personally, you know, so when you're the leader of a company, especially if you're the founder, you know that you have to fail yourself to success. People, uh, act as though success and failure are on two ends and they're opposite things, when in fact, failure is part of success. And it's important not to take things too personally, because if you take your wins too personally, you run the risk of becoming arrogant. You run the risk of not being open and coachable, not not being able to learn from your team and move with them. But if you also take your failures and your shortcomings too personally, then you just don't move forward at all. Uh, You kind of get stuck. Um, so first, be impeccable with your word. Two, don't take things personally. Three, don't make assumptions. You know, um, when you're leading a team, yeah, a lot of people when they when they lack accountability, when there's a lack of accountability in an organization, leaders. Uh, one thing that leaders say all the time, and we hear it in our coaching sessions, uh, I'm not here to babysit anybody. They are all adults. So they should know what to do, and that's a real big assumption to make. You know, like you need to make sure that everything is clear 
find the courage to ask questions and to express what you really want, what you really want done, what you really want your company to stand for. Communicate clearly to avoid misunderstandings, to avoid the drama and all of that, you know. Um, and then the last one is to always do your best. You know, as a leader, most likely you are um, always striving to do better. You're committed to self-improvement, self-excellence, self etc. And uh, sometimes that could be you, you kind of become like a perfectionist. And it's not about being a perfectionist. It's all about just committing to excellence. And committing to excellence means that you're doing your best all the time with whatever you have. So those are the four agreements that I have made with myself. And I think that uh, I tell every time we have a coaching session, whether I'm coaching parents or whether we are coaching leaders, I tell them about these four agreements because it's what I have used to help me manage the pressure of leadership. Can you talk to us about the signs of employee going out and how this can be remedied? Okay, so... Uh, one of the telling signs is, you know, just people's body language, the overall energy of the place. Um, as the leader, you need to know your people, you know, so you need to pay attention to the nonverbal signs, the nonverbal um attributes of your people how do they behave when they're happy how do how do they behave when they're sad how do they behave when they're agitated and if you're able to really um if you understand your people then they don't even need to say it you could you could tell from their body language from just the energy in the room um also like in terms of their productivity if you have an employee say tim and Tim is producing results all the time. And then all of a sudden, Tim's results start to slow down. Let's say he's in the sales department and he makes 40 sales calls a week. But then all of a sudden, Tim is making like 20 or 30. You know, it's like, what's going on here? A telling sign of employee burnout would be a reduction in their productivity. Um, even let's say you have another employee, Stacy, and she's always early. She's always punctual. And then all of a sudden she is late or she's staying home, or, you know, those sorts of things. These are signs that uh, um, your employees may be experiencing burnout. And uh, the thing is that uh, you need to have open communication in your organization so that people feel okay to talk about when they're feeling a little stressed out or anything like that. Akira, do you have anything to add to that? Nothing in terms of the signs. I, I agree with those signs. Um, I have some stuff for, for the remedy to show. Um, and the first one is your communication with them. You have to... So that's, again, one of the things that people might ignore you know, which is a common thing that we discussed before. As a leader, you, you need to be willing to discuss everything with anyone at any time. When you see somebody having this, there is also a good chance that it's connected to personal challenges because it's, things aren't just overwhelming and difficult for leaders. It's overwhelming for everybody because everybody is a leader in their own life, um, for yourself, for your family, for even your friends, whoever. So sometimes the personal side of things becomes challenging for you for one reason or the next. And that is why you might be more burnt out or more tired. Um, so sometimes you just need your leader to talk to you to let you know that you have their support. You might need some time off um, or just to have, a, have some things taken off your plate for the while just so you could deal with the personal things or just let a little time pass before you're back to being yourself. You know, and one of the big things is that Sometimes people are just burnt out because the environment is just so unfulfilling. And as a leader, it's your job, your responsibility to help your people find fulfillment. And that is, that's, I think, the last topic that I cover in, in my coaching program because it, I just want to end on that high note to let leaders know that more than anything, your job is actually to help these people find fulfillment in their lives. It's not just to give them work to do they're not, just there, they're not there to serve you. You actually have the honor and the privilege of serving them. And you need to give them a vision that inspires them, that gives them purpose and meaning in their life, right? Something that lets them feel part of something bigger than themselves. And when you have this, 
Yes, you will feel tired at times, but you don't feel that spiritual burnout, that existential burnout that makes people want to just change everything in their life and just curl up in a ball in bed, right? Because you know that I am working for something big. I am part of something big. I am improving life. I'm impacting the world. So yes, I'm a bit tired now, but I could push more and I could do more. I might just need to go to the beach for a little bit and come back and then I'll be good again. But if there's no fulfillment in, in the workplace, there's no real vision we're working towards, we don't trust each other here at work, we don't love each other, we don't respect each other, then people will burn out quickly and they want to leave. So the leader has to deal with all these things first, set a real vision, create a good culture, and then people are much less likely to be burnt out. And when they do have these moments of fatigue, just a little conversation with them, giving them some little time to spend time with their family, to just go for a walk, have a walking meeting with them. Even that might immediately cure it because they get some sunlight, they get that blood flow and that oxygen pumping. And all of these are just some ways that that not very difficult that you could avoid a lot of sense and remedy burnout. So we get ready to wrap up. But you, how can people get in contact with you? The best and easiest way is social media. My Instagram and LinkedIn are my main ones. So both of them are Akira Heath Adams, spelled A K I R I Heath Adams. And also our website, HeathAdamsLeadership.com, where you could leave comments, you could sign up, you could subscribe to the, the blogs, the newsletter. And there's tons of free leadership content there that you could enjoy at your own convenience. And hopefully it will help you become a better leader in life. Can you share your in details in terms of contact? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I oh. use LinkedIn and Instagram a lot, so it's uh, um, really easy to connect with me there. It's my name, Tanisha, T-E-E-N-I-S-H-A, uh, Heath Adams, H-E-A-T-H, uh, A-D-A-M-S. Um, and yeah, you find me on LinkedIn and Instagram. I also i am quite active on Twitter, so social media is the best ways to get me. Before we go, I just want to invite you, uh, both of you, to share a bit about your your business, uh, Eat Adams Leadership. What services do you provide? Eat Adams Leadership is a leadership consultancy. We work uh, primarily with founders and CEOs. We have a eight-week leadership training program where we do all our sessions via Zoom or any platform that is most convenient. Uh, it's a uh, uh, comprehensive leadership training that focuses on the personal side and the organizational side. So the goal is that after eight weeks, you will become a much more confident version of yourself. You will overcome any of the fears and insecurities that may be holding you back and you will have the tools to build and lead a team to successfully grow your company. We do sometimes make exceptions and work with managers, but our focus is primarily on founders and CEOs, helping them to become the best version of themselves. Talking to you today, Reminded me of a John Maxwell quote that says, everything rises, falls on leadership. That's a good quote. That's a good quote. One that we believe in wholeheartedly. All right. So all that's left for me now is to say thank you and to wish you all, all the best. Thank you very much for having us, Colin. We, uh, we appreciate Thank you so it much for having us. We'd be, happy, we'd be happy to be back. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Legal Corner podcast series. For more information, please visit us at our Facebook or Instagram pages or send your comments to the Legal Corner Podcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you.